sorry also, my, my English is not perfect by any means. My Russian is a bit worse. So I'll, <laughs> I'll just stick to, to English. Spasiba. Uh, and that's pretty bad because my fiance is Russian. But <laughs> that's a separate story. All right. So um, just before starting, one, one question to the audience. Who is here familiar with uh, Kubernetes? Okay. And who runs, uh, other than Alexander, uh, productions on Kubernetes, production workloads? And Kubernetes and why it could be interesting for many to, to use Kubernetes. And then I'll go through explaining a work that we have been doing in our company, which is open source and which enables a managed service experience for Postgres. So basically, a few commands will get down to one command, real installation to have a full Postgres cluster. So before diving into that, just a brief introduction about myself. Yes, I am the main author of this project, the Billion Tables project, where yes, we were able to create one billion tables within a Postgres database. Actually, we created two billion tables within a Postgres database and found that there is a limit. It's a little, a little, bit, little bit below two to the 31. Um, so it's basically two to the 31 minus the number of entries on PG type divided by two. More or less, that number of tables you can create on Postgres. So uh, yes, uh, um, I founded a company called Ongres, which means on Postgres. So you can figure out what we do. And we try to do R&D and create, come up with crazy ideas like this billion tables project or like uh, ToroDB, which is software to replicate live from MongoDB to Postgres or a few others. I also participate significantly in the Postgres community. I give many talks. Uh, I started creating a personal web page, and I recounted all my talks. Next year, I'm going to make my 100th talk uh, in the last 10 years, but my cycle is the, the last five years. And yeah, also was announced yesterday as an Amazon data hero. All right, so enough about myself. Let's make an introduction about the problem that we are trying to solve here. But before that, let me make a brief introduction about what Kubernetes is for those of you who are not that much familiar. And let me use a probably a terrible, terrible comparison. But because I love Java, I believe that Kubernetes is somehow kind of the JVM of the distributed systems. And what I mean by this, something heavyweight and no, Java is not either. So what I mean is that if you think about infrastructure today and you want to deploy a workload on any infrastructure, it changes a lot the code you run, or the scripts you run, or the commands you run to deploy in different infrastructure. So if it's a cloud, probably you'll use some tools. If it's another cloud, you'll use some tools. Even if you use things like Terraform, or Packer, or Ansible, things will be significantly different from environment to environment, even more if you're not on the cloud, even, even more if you're on-premise. So the infrastructure is a totally heterogeneous space. And when you think of it, when you think about preparing a software to bundle together some pieces and say, deploy this, well, there's no standard way of doing that. And that is what essentially Kubernetes has, has brought into the place. It's a layer of abstraction. You use a declarative API to specify which things, which resources you want to be created in this underlying infrastructure. And then there's going to be an operator for that, uh, not Kubernetes operator, uh, person, the sysadmin DevOps, that is going to take care of having installed Kubernetes in such a way that those requests for the resources you're requesting can be fulfilled in this precise environment. So that means that when you request a volume to store some data on on-premise might be just a, a, a SAN uh, server, whereas on cloud it's going to be cloud disk. Uh, when you request networking, it might go to, or load balancer, it might go on premise to an F5 or whatever it is, whereas on the given cloud, it's going to go to a given load balancer, or on a different cloud, it's going to go to a different load balancer. 
But the good thing is Kubernetes is this API that abstracts you away from the details of the implementation, and that's why I call it a JVM, because the JVM you just program on any JVM language like Java, and then it's the operating system and the JVM itself responsible for mapping that and creating the sockets you need or the files you want to write. Um, and it provides this very rich, uh, rich set of APIs, like it provides uh, node management and discovery, secrets, uh, storage, uh, networking, and all kinds of services that we need to deploy any production environment. And everything is code, so anything can be automated. So this is the idea about Kubernetes and why we believe it's interesting. The idea that I want to show you today it stemmed from, from this principle, from the principle that we wanted to deploy a set of components but we want to create only one of those packages. We analyze uh, all, the, all the possibilities that we've done wor working for the last decade for our customers, and we realized we needed like 50 versions of our Postgres with its own components. And that is impossible. So Kubernetes allows you, runs on any cloud, runs on-premise, runs on many environments on your laptop, and you can uh, package everything as a single package targeting this Kubernetes API. Now, for also those of you who are not that familiar with Kubernetes, there is a concept called an operator. And the idea of or what it is a Kubernetes operator is basically a good pattern in, in deployment, which means that there is basically an, an application running inside of Kubernetes, that is the operator itself or the controller for the operator, that is watching for your requests and creates yet another abstraction to represent and encapsulate the knowledge of what you want to do in, in a custom way. Let's say, for example, we're talking here about Postgres. So when you are requesting Kubernetes through the API to create a Postgres cluster, you may not know, you don't want to know how to configure replication among the nodes, how to configure high availability, how to configure backups and recovery. You just want to specify that you want n number of replicas of this size. So this is the pattern of an operator. An operator is an application that will understand these concepts, that will have all the internal knowledge about how to configure these things, how to configure Postgres with these things, and will expose you a very top high-level interface which will encapsulate all this knowledge for you. And with that, you can build intelligence into this operator, and you can automate processes like, for example, performing a minor version upgrade. Minor version upgrade is something that is very straightforward algorithm. You can iterate through it. You will probably spin up a new node, new container, on a container environment. You will then drain the, the, uh, the traffic on one of the nodes when that first container is uh, locked to the replication stream. Then you will kill that old one, and you will maintain the number of replicas, then you need to create a new one, so forth. When all the replicas have been upgraded, you, uh, you will do a, a control file, switch over to one of the new updated nodes, and then you're done. This is manually, can be done, but it's very straightforward to, to automate. And the operator can encapsulate all this knowledge. The same with all the tasks that are common DBA tasks that you're doing every day, right? Like you're doing vacuums, you're doing repacks, you're doing health checks. All this knowledge that implies internal knowledge of Postgres, in this case, can be also automated as part of, as part of an operator. Now, one of the concepts about this talk is being cloud native. And what, what is an application that is cloud native? Actually, it's a very loose term. But my own view on this is that an application that calls itself cloud native, and here we're aiming for Postgres in a cloud native way, it is something that A, is going to be designed to run on containers. Could also be VMs, but for now, uh, we're sticking to containers. I mean, the technology world more or less is around containers, even though there's some interesting developments on lightweight VMs. And it's something that is also designed for scalability and reliability. It is something that um, you know, will be ready to, with very easy uh, way, scale the number of nodes, uh, tolerate node failures, and so forth. And then it needs to follow some best practices. Best practices like, for example, uh, trying to have a single process hierarchy per container. Uh, I'll speak about this more later right now. Uh, and then use sidecars to separate functionalities. I also talk about the sidecars. And, and finally, also some uh, 
take some concepts about how to design for containers that they may fail. I'll also discuss about this. So let's, let's dive a little bit deeper. So first of all, containers are not slim VMs. Most people say, oh, you know, moving to Kubernetes is not that difficult. Uh, we have this VM. Let's just drop in, put it into a container. And that kind of works. But containers are not lightweight VMs. They do not abstract you from the OS. They're just, containers are just a thin wrapper over a process hierarchy. It abstracts the file system, it abstracts, abstracts the network, abstracts the process space, optionally, by the way. But that's it. It's still a process running on the same host as any other containers, as any other processes. And so the life cycle of a container is tied to the life cycle of the, pro of the first process that runs inside of it. So you can run in it on, on, on a container if so you want, but this is not a well-accepted well pattern. The pattern is a container per process, or more precisely, per process hierarchy. Second, you don't need a whole OS inside of the container. Just have the binary that runs your container workload. If that binary requests external files, you can also add some external files. Um, maybe you want some support files also if you want to run other processes within the container with uh, exec. Um, you may need some extra files and libraries, but you don't need anything else. You don't need a full-blown OS. You don't need uh, kernel modules. You don't need these device drivers. That's, that's all that you have. So um, we aim for minimal containers, which will execute only a single process hierarchy. OK, so how do we apply all these principles to make Postgres cloud native? Postgres has not been designed to be cloud native as such. So we have been doing, uh, I would say, a significant effort to try to understand and re-engineer how to, from a DevOps perspective, package Postgres in a way that is truly cloud native. So can we do this? Is this a good idea? Is Postgres prepared for containers? First question that arises, overhead. What is the performance? Well, the overhead is minimal. We can say that it's around, we've done a lot of benchmarking, 1%, 2%. But really, containers are not a VM. Containers are just a process, or a set of processes running on, on the host OS anyway. So there's not a significant impact on performance per se. There's some abstraction layer, but it's, it's, it's minimal. Second concern is that, oh, but you know, containers are designed for stateless workloads only, and they are ephemeral. They can disappear any time. Well, not any time. A container dies when the process that it's running dies. Because as I said, a container is tied to the process or the process hierarchy that it wraps. So if the process finishes or dies, then container so does. But if the process don't die, the container neither. So it's not that the container will spuriously die. It will be for there for as long as the process is running. And if the process is something like Postgres, which is running, it will continue running. The other option is that if the node dies. Well, if the node dies, the container dies. This is pretty trivial, right? Um, and there's yet another case, which is when Kubernetes decides to reschedule the pod and do some tricks. And, but yes, that could happen. But there's also ways to prevent that from happening. So, Yes, it is easier to, to do this with stateless apps, but it's definitely possible and definitely doable with stateful apps. And actually, it's very good, this environment, because all the problems that are extremely hard um, on non-containerized environments, such as the, what we call, for example, the entry point problem, which is how do you locate the master instance? Well, you know, if you, if you use IPs, static IPs, that will not work because the master instance may be switching from one node to another one if there's a node failure. And then you need to think about uh, the, all the options available, floating IPs or virtual IPs, DNS, um, and, and, and many other options that you may have on load balancers, but those are different per environment. Precisely what I was explaining at the beginning, that they may change, they may be different from environment to environment, and you need to create a lot of logic to support all those use cases. Within a containerized environment, managing the network is abstracted away from the actual network. All right, so how do we generate a minimal container image, uh, and, and why we do that? First of all, 
it's also a security principle. The less code that we have in the container, the less attack surface that we are exposing. So just put only the binaries, only the libraries, only the support files that you need. You don't need documentation. You don't even need psql. That's a client program. You don't need a client program. This is a container for a server program. Uh, you don't need init <laughs> because you're going to run only a single process hierarchy. And then there is a, a, a pattern in Kubernetes called the sidecar pattern. Um, in, in Kubernetes, you don't schedule containers directly. You schedule pods. And what is a pod? A pod is a set of uh, one or more containers. And they run alongside. This one of the abstractions that is present on, on containers, which is the abstraction of the IP and network space, that is uh, contained within the pod and not the container, which means that within a pod you can have several containers that are essentially running on the same virtual network environment, and basically they share the IP and the port space, which means you, know, you can run alongside processes on different ports and they, will, they can cooperate. And definitely, if you enable uh, a property called share namespace true, they can share this process namespace, they can see the other processes, and, and you can share files, even virtual files like sockets, for example, and you can connect via local host among all those containers. So rather than creating a huge humongous container with all the programs and services and an init system that you need, it's better to split into separate containers. Each of one does a single task. And I'll show you examples of how we have achieved this. Last but not least, how do we do HA? So I said that a cloud native application is one that uses and leverages this high availability, but how do you do high availability on, on Kubernetes? Actually, Kubernetes has a mechanism for high availability. It has mechanisms for leader election. But leader election in Kubernetes is not aware of replication lag and replica status in general. So it's not adequate for Postgres. So um, in our case, we prefer to use Postgres specific high availability mechanisms, and specifically one tool called Patroni, which is mainly produced and coded by one of the, our people in the audience today, Alexander, thank you, great tool. And so we leverage Postgres specific tools for this purpose. Also important for us as part of a cloud native application is to implement centralized logging. Because now if you administer a cluster of Postgres instance, you may say, oh, I want to connect to this Postgres instance, I want to connect to this Postgres instance. How do you connect? Oh, you do SSH. No, there's no SSH. Because SSH would be yet another daemon running. We, we don't want to do that. We want to pull, and then if you're trying to track a problem in a Postgres cluster and you need to follow the timeline between an event that's happened on the master and then on this replica and this, this other replica, you're going to need to bounce from hosts and logs, files, and that is very time consuming. It's so much better to just pull the logs to a central location. This doesn't mean that you'll not be able to run a command inside a Postgres container uh, because there is still an option to do, for example, a, a, uh, to run a command there, right? You don't just don't need SSH. But it's much better to pull the centralized logging to a single place and then parse and process the logs there. All right, so with all this in mind, we have built a software, an open source software called Stackgres. And Stackgres, as I will explain right now, it is a stack of components that run on top of Postgres, and this is a sign for Kubernetes. So before explaining a little bit more detail about what Stackgres is, um, I have prepared a live demo, which very likely will fail, as any live demo, right? Um, but I'll give it a try. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to kick off the demo, because uh, I'm going to create a Kubernetes cluster from scratch, so that there's no trick here. If you believe that everything is prepared, nothing is prepared. So I'm just going to create a, a, a a, a cluster, Kubernetes cluster from scratch, so you'll believe it is empty and we'll create a Postgres cluster afterwards. You'll see how easy it is if it works. Um, by the way, this demo, I tried really hard uh, to make it work on Yandex Cloud and I experienced some difficulties, uh, not attributable to the software itself, I believe. So if there is anyone here from Yandex Cloud and want to talk about more about what uh, issues we encounter, feel free to talk to me afterwards. So I'm going to run this demo on Google Cloud, which means also I'm going to rely on a network and connections and all these things. So uh, let me start from the very beginning. Uh, can everybody read this font? Is this OK? Yeah? All right. 
So, um, all right, so I'm going to run this command. This command should create a, a Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud. It will take like five minutes. That's why I want to run this command right now. This is not Stackrest, it's just create a Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud. Just for the record, well, yeah, I'll show that later. There is no such cluster. So I'm going to create a cluster called Stackrest Demo JKE cluster. All right? All right, creating. So let's go back for now for the presentation. We'll, we'll come back to the demo later, just because it takes like five minutes or so. All right, so what is Stackrest? So Stackrest is cloud native Postgres. And this means that it's something, a Postgres uh, set of components designed to run on Kubernetes. That means that it runs almost everywhere. Because any cloud, most clouds at least, and there is also a possibility to run Kubernetes on-premise. So it's designed to run almost anywhere. It's not a specific for any given cloud or any given on-premise technology. Second is a stack, hence the name. And a stack means that is, you know, you know, like a stack of components. And Postgres is something that doesn't run alone by itself. You don't just ape to get install Postgres and deploy that to production. You need more components on top of it. That's why we call it stack and it has all these components. And the goal of Stackrest is to provide what it would be a database as a service experience. Something like RDS, if you're familiar with Amazon RDS experience. With a few clicks on a GUI or with a few commands, you'll be able to create a Postgres cluster that will be managed uh, mostly automatically, but you will own it. You'll have root access or Postgres access. And last but not least, this is built on top of our long experience with working with large very large Postgres cluster customers in, in critical, mission critical production scenarios, and we call it an enterprise stack. It is ready for and built with all this experience and knowledge around running an enterprise grade Postgres stack. So just imagine Postgres installation is just 25 megabytes. And that's generous by all means, because that's including documentation and many files which you don't really need for a production workload. Now, again, would you take this into production? Maybe you need to do some tuning first, significant tuning. And uh, if you're interested, by the way, on that, I gave a talk last year or two years ago here, high load. Uh, I think last year. No, two years ago, yes. That was very, very popular, called Postgres Configuration for Humans. And if, if you look for that, you'll, you'll have a lot, see a lot of recommendations on how to tune Postgres. But then you'll probably want connection pooling. You definitely want connection pooling with Postgres almost always. And as I said before, centralized logging. But then also you'll want monitoring. And then you want backups, right? And then you want high availability. And then you want tools for log parsing. And then you want periodic health checks, and so forth and so forth and so forth. So you need to now take all these components, and actually you need to select them from the Postgres ecosystem because there's no such a central tool for monitoring Postgres. There's not a vendor-specific tool for Postgres HA. You need to go into the ecosystem, look at the many options available, pick the one that is the best, or at least the best for your own needs, know how to tune it, and know how to make it work together with the rest of pieces. This is no easy task, no easy task at all. And the idea is that these will be all packaged for you. That's why we call Stackrest a Postgres distribution. If you think of it, what is the Linux kernel? Do you run the Linux kernel on your computers? No. You need a Linux kernel and a Linux distribution. Stackrest is the Linux distribution. Postgres is the Linux kernel. We have decided to create the container images based on a distribution uh, called UBI8 which is a minimal subset of Red Hat 8, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, target for containers. We use this image because A is very minimal. It is less than 100 megabytes. And together with our minimal packing of Postgres means that our Postgres container is like 116 megabytes. Then it becomes just slightly bigger because we also have Petroni there. But that's the base image. It's very lightweight. 
And second, because this is free, totally redistributable, there's no subject to any licensing, but customers who use this, users who use this with our customers of Red Hat, they will get automatically support. So it's very convenient, and it's extremely well uh, curated distribution of Linux. Uh, there's periodic updates on, on security, and it's, it's, it's very enterprise-grade, honestly, image. So what does Stackgres provide? What is the stack of components that Stackgres is providing? So first, let's go from the bottom to the top. It contains an UB88 minimal image. Then on top of that, we add vanilla Postgres 11. Actually, it's already 12 also. Um, and that means that there's no changes to Postgres. So Stackgres is no Postgres variation. It's pure vanilla open source Postgres. No changes to any application that will run against Stackgres. This is the distribution again. He provides uh, uh, persistent storage via a mechanism that is uh, provided by Kubernetes called a storage class. A storage class is something that allows you to define how you want your storage to be on a Kubernetes cluster. You can specify if you want an SSD storage, a local storage, a network storage uh, of this size or these capabilities, and you can specify that and a storage class an abstraction. So we leverage that to run the storage of your database on whatever kind of a storage you want. It comes tuned by default. So Postgres, you always need to tune for your own, um, for your own use case. But there are certain, certain patterns that most of them don't come with Postgres vanilla stock configuration, but we are providing guidance and, and some stock configuration on that. Then there's even an util container, which is a separate container because in Kubernetes, again, uh, you know, if you need to do psql or if you do to, need to do ls or if you need to, to run commands to administer Postgres, that, those commands do not need to be part of the main image. They don't, need, they don't need to be there present even all the time. So right now, they are a sidecar, they're a, a util container, uh, but Kubernetes 1.16 has added support for ephemeral containers. They're going to jump into ephemeral containers so that you just run this on demand. And yes, whenever you want to do a psql, then you'll fire this container. Otherwise, you'll have less footprint for most of the time. So on top of this base layer of Postgres itself, there's another layer which had all, all, all the components that are critical for any enterprise-grade Postgres, like, for example, connection pooling. There is few use cases where you don't want to have a connection pooler in front of Postgres. So this comes by default. You can enable or disable it at will. And it's just a Boolean flag for you. Do you want connection pooling? Yes or no? That's it. I'll show you later. Then it contains the HA component, which is critical. Uh, we use, again, Patroni, as I mentioned before. And by the way, uh, Patroni comes with the same Postgres on the same Postgres container. And then you may think, oh, this is a violation of the principle you stated before of a single process hierarchy. You have binary, I mean, the Patroni program and Postgres program. That is not true because Patroni actually starts and stops Postgres, manages Postgres lifecycle. So it is, it is apparent for Postgres. So it's still a single process hierarchy. The root is Patroni and then Postgres and all these processes, Postgres processes and underneath it. Then it provides capabilities to scale to any number of nodes. This is kind of easy to do on Kubernetes, and you know, um, we'll try to do that. Just edit the config file, and you'll say, I want more nodes, and that's it, or less nodes. And then it provides two entry points, a read-write one for the master, and a load-balanced read-only if you want to do read, on, uh, read queries to the replicas. Then on top of these core capabilities and enterprise complements, then we have uh, some higher, higher um, and added capability functionalities to the stack which is centralized log management, monitoring, in which case we use Prometheus, which is a dependency for the system to work, and also backup system that is enabled to backup to a persistent volume or to a, a cloud storage. And last but not least, there is a plain uh, layer for management. And it provides a CLI for, uh, for management, plus all the kubectl commands, obviously, and a web UI for also simple web UI-based administration. So just a brief overlook at the architecture, and then we'll jump into this demo, which, by the way, let me just check that everything worked correctly, which, of course, should have. Yeah, it looks good. There's apparently a cluster there. Um, so what is the, the main architecture? So if you look at the pod, 
I explained to you that the pod is a, is a set of one or more containers, and we exploit heavily the sidecar pattern um, where we separate concerns, separate responsibilities into different containers. So within a pod, we have the main pod, which is this, this bar that we have on, on the left, which is a Postgres and Petroni uh, container. And then there's other separate containers that are running alongside it. They're sharing the process namespace because of the use of this shared process namespace true. And we have these other containers. We have pgutil, which is where it contains all the other utility tools that you don't need to run Postgres, but you may want to have to uh, administer Postgres eventually. And this, again, will jump to a, into a femoral container uh, in some time. Then there's connection pooling, which is optional. We use right now PG Bouncer. And there's, there's another one for forwarding the logs, another to export the metrics. And, and there's actually a, a, quite a few other that are uh, being developed right now. I'll, I'll show you, for example, the example with uh, the proxy. This might be a bit small for you to read, but basically, on, if you look at the whole architecture, there's going to be a, a whole cluster is going to consist of several pods. One of them is going to be the leader or the master. The other ones are going to be replicas. There's two entry points exposed, the read-write, which is always going to the leader, and the read-only that is load balances across the replicas. If we look a little bit into more detail of how the storage is accomplished, um, it is uh, actually quite standard. Kubernetes, there's these storage classes. Storage classes allows for dynamic provisioning of volumes. So you can just uh, call uh, the API and uh, start provisioning volumes from these uh, storage classes. And then those volumes will be created automatically by Kubernetes. And then you use a claim, a PVC, a persistent volume claim. This is kind of a handle or a voucher which you use to attach these volumes to the pods. And each pod has its own volume. And, and so they're typically network, disk, network disks, and each pod will have its own volumes. These volumes, by default, are not destroyed if the pod is destroyed. They're, they're kept. And um, the networking part, which adds yet another sidecar that we're introducing in the next version of Stackrest, Stackrest right now at version 0.7, um, version 0.8 is coming, and in this version we're introducing a new sidecar, proc uh, which is an Envoy proxy, which uh, will allow us to uh, proxy the connections and perform all the operations that we're going to need to perform in order to automate several operations at the network level and be able to drain traffic, to reroute the traffic, and also to export metrics of the traffic uh, to Prometheus, which I think is kind of cool. And this is how it works. It exposes two ports one for the uh, Postgres port, one for replication. This one is internal for the cluster. It's not exposed to the public, um, but it's used separately because uh, some connection pullers, which may be used inside, do not uh, proxy the replication protocol. This is a timeline, approximately, of uh, the development process. We are expecting a, a 1.0 version, at least on release candidate, at the end of the year. And uh, basically, we're adding now uh, backup functionality and Envoy proxying for 0 0.8. And uh, 0 0.9 version will add extension capabilities and centralized logging. So let's uh, go back to the demo and see if we can make this work, more or less. So we have created a cluster. Let's check that it uh, actually exists. Um, let's run cluster info command. And we'll show that, yes, there is apparently a cluster there. And if we just uh, check, for example, about the pods, there should be no pods on the default namespace. And if we check all the system pods, there's a few that are running there. But that's just, uh, sorry, Google, Google stuff running there on the cluster. So all looks good. So let's then go and install the Stackrest software. And we have designed this in such a way that installation should happen on a single command. Right now, we are providing Helm, which is a usual uh, system for packaging and distributing uh, components on top of Kubernetes. Um, and it's the preferred way because you can customize the installation. Um, but we're going to expose also a URL for single command installation. For now, I'm going to use Helm. So let me just um, use Helm template for this. Uh, Helm template. and. 
This is, by the way, just directly from the GitLab uh, repo. So if you just clone the repo, you might be able to reproduce the same operations as I'm doing right now. This is just directly the GitLab repo. So stack reps operator. Um, I'm going to specify here a name. Let's call this SG cluster, for example. SG, uh, yeah, SG. And stack, stack reps operator. And that's uh, pretty much it. And so. This should generate, by the way, let, let me show you this to you. This should generate JAML set of files that are provided to you. You don't need to write this, but these are the, the JAML uh, files that will be pushed to Kubernetes to install Stackers. So let's try to run this directly. So basically this calls Helms, render some templates, parse some variables, and then this will feed that to kubectl which will create the resources specified in these config files. All right, looks good. It says has created some stuff. We can check, for example, if there's some um, stateful sets. Uh, stack is a stateful set under the hood, so there should be uh, no, but this is because this is on the stack namespace. No, okay. Uh, st no, okay, whatever. Um, let's check the parts. Yeah, there is the pods running there. Should be a stack rest namespace. Anyway, so the, the pods are, are being, for the operator, are being created right now. We may need to wait a little bit more until this, uh, let's use uh, stack rest. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's finalized, the, the operator. So now we have the operator running. So this is stack rest installation. It was, as you saw, just a single command, and now we've been able to uh, install this Stackware software. Now, we have done nothing yet, just the installation procedure. So now let's create a cluster. Before that, let me dive a little bit deeper into how um, Stackware works. So Stackware exposes now high-level interfaces for you to work. And it will expose several objects, again, that are very high-level, which you will need to create to instantiate a cluster. First of all, it asks you to specify an instance profile. What is an instance profile? It's basically the size of a, the, the container you want to run the workloads on. The, the CPU, the, the, the RAM file, the RAM, et cetera. But we want to give this a name because we believe those could be reusable. And maybe in the future they need to be approved by a single company and say you can only create instances of this or this type. So we just ask you to create those, give them a name, and then reference those whenever you're creating an, a, a, a cluster. So you'll say this cluster is going to use instances of this instance profile name. The same with configuration. Maybe you can create independently Postgres configurations with the parameter files you can pass to Postgres. Um, some of them are blacklist, but there is just a minority that are essential to the operation of the cluster. But most of them you can tune at will. And these configurations might be reused. So we ask you to create a configuration and give it a name. And you can reuse them when you create the clusters. The same with the connection pooling uh, configurations. The same with the backup uh, schedules. And finally, you create a cluster. So let me actually run this. Um, let's create this uh, SG cluster, for example. And I'm just going to show you the result of what this looks like. Um, so again, if we use this, um, so here there's there's an example, and this will generate a file. I'm just going to. Dump it to file for you to see. This is the cluster. Let's call it cluster. So basically, there is a few objects here. Let me actually uh, move this one to the end. To the end, it's going to be easier to explain. Okay. So first of all, here let me actually start from the very beginning. It's going to be better. Instance profile. So this is an instance profile. An instance profile is just a custom object. This is called a CRD in Kubernetes. And we say, you know, we're going to define an instance profile called size excess, like a small instance. That is, you know, um, let's say you have a core CPU and 500 megabytes of RAM. Then there's a S size instance. Then there's an M size instance. And then I will just reference those. Then I'll say, give me a Postgres config or a Postgres conf pooling configuration. For example, it's going to use a connection pooler here. This is PG Bouncer. And let's use transaction mode and these parameters to configure PG Bouncer. And I'll just give this 
this name, pgbouncerconf. Then let's create um, Postgres configuration. And I want to have a Postgres configuration for Postgres version 11. I'm going to call it PostgresConf. And then I'll set these parameters, for example. These are the instance sizes that we saw before. And finally, let's create the cluster. And now the cluster is a really high-level object. We give it a name, and then we just need to say, oh, I want three instances. I want, actually, let's make it to two better, first place, two instances. I want a Postgres 11, and I use, when I use this config, and I use this connection pooling config, and this size for the instance that I specified before. And you see, this is in reality, once you have created the profiles and the configurations, this is the only thing that you need to deploy a fully featured Postgres cluster with Stackers. So let's, let's run it. So, all right, it's working. It will take a few minutes to run, uh, probably less than that. But there should be some, yeah, you see there's an, a node now being created. It contains uh, four uh, containers in total right now, and they're just running the init containers, and after, those, uh, after this, we'll start creating uh, the, the pods itself. So uh, while this creates, it, it will take just a couple of minutes, I'll continue with the demo. But in the meantime, any question? I'll take some questions for now. Um, uh, how easy would it be to customize um, Stackgres with my own uh, Docker image? Or? Okay, so um, that's two separate questions. One extensions and one custom image for Postgres. Um, the first one extensions is a core functionality of our upcoming 0 0.9 version. So we're gonna deal with that. Uh, Postgres extensions that come with Contrib, they are present already. And uh, we're going to provide a mechanism for you to upload any extension that you want. So there's no restrictions. This is not like a managed service where you're only whitelisted to a few extensions. Any extensions that you may compile to Postgres, we're actually uh, planning to provide a container for building the extensions. And they will be perfectly packaged to run on a Stackgres environment. So you'll be able to supply your own extensions, no limits whatsoever. In terms of Postgres version, uh, for now we're sticking to our own Postgres supplied version, which is vanilla Postgres. And uh, if I supply my extensions, can they build, be built from source or do yes. you need? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we're going to provide a container, a builder container, so you can build uh, your own extensions. Right. And when is that? Uh, we're targeting that 0 0.9, which is target for December. Okay. Next okay, month. Thank you. Yeah, next question. Mm -hmm. My cluster is growing, database is growing. I want to use bigger instance. Should I remove complete cluster and recreate it from scratch just to increase some parameter? No, absolutely not. So there's, there's two ways of doing that. First is to um, you can load some downtime. It's very simple. You just tear down the cluster. The disks are going to remain there. Uh, basically, just change the config. Uh, like this same config file that I executed right now, just change it to a different instance size. And because the, the disks are persistent, the storage is persistent, you will bring back up with a, with a, with a new container size. Um, if you need to schedule new nodes because they're not capaci uh, full capacity, then you may need to pull those, uh, bring those nodes to the Kubernetes cluster first, maybe assign some uh, affinity rules to target those new nodes. It's for you to reschedule there. But essentially, it's going to be a few seconds minutes at most of downtime. But we're planning for online disk, uh, uh, for, for disks, for example, for online disk uh, resizing, because that's also allowed for as part of the Kubernetes API. Let's have a, another one, and after that we'll see if the cluster is ready. Yes, agreed. So my question is, uh, if uh, my database is under heavy load and I need to troubleshoot it, I usually, in case of RDS, I talk to support people. In case of when I manage Postgres, I use the tools I know. I, I SSH to the box and I use uh, Perf and other tools. How to do it here? Well, um, so first of all, you 
you have full control of the cluster. Uh, you can connect to uh, also that right away. You can connect to any any pod, and you can connect to this utility uh, pod actually, and run any any command there that is present on, as part of this pod. Right now, we are providing basic tools for Postgres administration, and it, that's why actually we are still not running on distroless containers, which will be containers with just exactly the binaries for running Postgres, but rather those that contain basically UBI 8, which is this Red Hat-based image, and contains many of usual administration tools. Are there all, the, all administration tools there yet? No. Um, but you know the project is just on GitLab file an issue and say, you know, I want this tool because I, I use it and I would like to have it. Thank you. All right, yes, yeah, so let me continue just a little bit with the demo. So it looks like everything is OK. There's a couple of Postgres uh, uh, nodes here, each running with uh, uh, having several containers on them. And let's see if this is actually something that we can, we can run. So let me just, um, for the sake of going faster, just copy and paste a few commands. Um, so let's, for example, Ramp is equal. You were asking about these tools, right? Administration tools. PSQL is not part of the Postgres container. It's a separate util container. That's why I need to call the, uh, the util container. And, you know, well, here we have a database. This database didn't exist before. It's been created for us. Let's actually do something like uh, create a database. Uh, high load, for example. Let's connect to this database. Let's create some data there. Let's create table uh, high load. Uh, select, for example, certain maybe uh, like a million rows there. Okay, I have a million rows there. Now let's actually connect to the replica. This is going to be the replica, and should also work. And I should be able to connect to the same database that I created. And uh, there should be the same table and should have like a million entries there. Yeah, it looks like it does. So it's, it's replicating, right? Um, let's, for example, actually, yeah, use Petroni tool. It's, 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 this is Vendel. This comes on the main container because there's no other way around. And let's see if there's this cluster, let's check the cluster state. Yeah, so apparently there's a Stackgrass 0 is the leader and it's running. And then there's this Stackgrass 1, which is a replica. Um, there's no replication lag and it's working. So if you see with a single command, we install Stackgrass with another yet single command. Typically it will be four because I will create the instance profile first, the Postgres configuration first, the connection pooling configuration, and then cluster. But this cluster was just a YAML file of a few lines. And with that, I have created a cluster that contains connection pooling, that contains high availability, that contains uh, all, this, all these goodies, and some of them that are coming on the, on the next versions. So now let's do something quickly. Uh, I think we may have some minutes more. A couple of. Thank you. All right, let's, uh, well, let's, let's add a node. Let's add a node, or let's kill a node, because we don't have that much time anyway, so. So, for example, let's uh, let's kill this node, right? Stackers one. Uh, delete pod. So, what happens when I when a node dies? Well, the ZZ will be recreated. It'll take a few seconds, and it's already initializing, and it will be ready in a few seconds. Um, after that, I can try to kill the master, and we'll see that the new container will be spin up, and, and the master will be will be uh, created. But before doing that, just let me show you a final thing because I think we're a bit short on time. Um, so it also the stackers also uh, <laughs> what is here. Okay, something's wrong there. It's okay, I'll fix this very quickly. It's a demo, right? So anyway, there's, there's gotta be some, some problem. So this is the one that I want. Okay, so let's. All 
All right. And now I should be able to go to localhost, stackgress. Yes, stackgress. And uh, this is a small UI that comes also with the stackgress, which allows you to kind of list the clusters that are available. So here we have a cluster with a small load average right now of total memory, this used so far. Uh, I can check the number of uh, pods that are, we can see now that the replica has, has been able to be brought back automatically. Um, there's, there's monitoring being integrated right now with Grafana statistics. It's not working right now, but it's, it's gonna be integrated just, just here. And then you can see also all the objects that we created before, like the Postgres configuration, the connection pooling configuration, the size of the instances that we specified before. This is a bit work in progress right now, but the idea is that you're able to perform the same operations we're doing command line also from this UI interface. Um, and well, now the last thing I can do, if, um, but let's take some more questions. If there's any other question, we can try well, to just modify. Maybe only one. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, is it uh, operator and everything what you show is open source? Is it open source? Yes, yes, it's absolutely open source. Uh, it's it's on, on GitLab right now, uh, github.com slash ongressing slash stackres. There's also a website on stackres.io, which also links to it. Mm -hmm. Another question, maybe? Ah. Mm -hmm. uh, quite small uh, question. Uh, what's the performance of this uh, solution uh, comparing with the um, uh, uh, classical approach? I don't know. With the well, VMs, maybe. Yeah, as, as I mentioned before, the, the overhead uh, for running Postgres on a container is minimal. No, 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 not. I mean, like, not running just Postgres. As, uh, uh, Very do, do you mean uh, like um, uh, overall overhead is only one to two percent, or is it just something? Yeah, specific? yeah, that's that's all. So stackgress ah. is something that doesn't get in in the way of Postgres. Okay, okay. It is it Thank is just you. a control plane. It helps you create the stuff, but doesn't. It's not a middle a middle ground. It's not middleware. Okay. Thank you. Time off. Okay. Well, just uh, just. The last thing is, I'm not going to have time to run, or I'll start running this demo, but we had this, this, um, this file to create the cluster, right? And this one to create the instance. So if I would change this number from two to three and rerun this, this will create a third instance. I'll leave this running, uh, yeah. and if time comes, uh, we'll see it, but this will create just a, th a third instance in the cluster. And that's all that you need to add a new instance to the cluster. It'll start replicating automatically. We'll see them <coughs> while it goes. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your work with us. Thank you for making it open source. And, My pleasure. For, uh, and for this talk, please have a sign of gratitude oh, from us. Thank you. And some necessary. You travel a lot, I, I believe. Yes, you do. Thank uh, you very much. And maybe you remember which question was uh, was the best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I would say that the question about the extensions is very interesting because this is the main differentiating factor between a managed solution where you cannot install yeah. all the extensions you want. And those. Whoever it was, come here. Yeah. Yes. Tell us again, what's your name, where, uh, where do you work, and, and so on. Uh, Igor. Right? Igor. Uh, uh, the company name is RapidSoft. We develop the loyalty programs for the financial services, banks, telecoms, so on and so forth. Yeah. Thank you very much, and congratulations for the, for the best questions. Thank this, you very much for session. the question. It was yeah. very good. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Alvaro. All right, thank you.